Welcome to Business and Investing with Grant and Charlie, where we are enhancing your complete set of skills to build wealth inside and outside your business. Now, before I promote anything or even hit your disclaimer, Charlie, I have to let absolutely everybody know. People have been pinging me where they have just found out that Charlie actually laughs at my jokes because they've only ever listened to the audio version. And just so you know, Charlie's a wonderful human being, very intellectually smart, but he has a silent laugh. So anytime you hear a pause on this podcast, he ha, is ha, laughing. Ha, 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 <laughs> he is la- I'm putting it out there. The, my jokes are actually quite funny. I think a lot of people laugh at them. Just know Charlie has a silent laugh and he's laughing at my jokes. Do, do, I actually do that on purpose because I don't want the laughter to go over your intro. So I'll have to stop doing it. I'll let something out now. Just I that was a silent laugh. You just totally just like- did that. <laughs> It's like Morse code. It just doom, 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 doom. All right. If anyone wants to get notified every single time we drop one of these episodes, head over to businessandinvesting.com forward slash newsletter, put in your details, and we'll be nice enough to send you some information and maybe even a Christmas present or an Easter egg or whatever time of year it is. Now let's cue your disclaimer. It's Charlie here from Business and Investing, and I need to let you know that Grant, myself, and the Business and Investing team are in no way, shape, or form qualified to give you personal or specific financial advice. We strongly encourage you seek out and use professionals when you are making investment decisions or comparing investment products. All right, Grant, we're actually doing my favorite type of episode, a Q&A episode today. Now, for those that don't know, you can absolutely submit questions and Grant and I will do a Q&A episode every, I'll say now and again. We often have things we <laughs> want to cover. Very, but you, very non-committal. Like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, just do it short. I'll unpack the dishwasher every now and again. Like, <laughs> it's like, fine. I, got I don't want to lock myself in, right? <laughs> it's like, I need, I need some freedom within this show. I can't commit to this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you can send your questions in via the Facebook group or by replying if you're on the email list. We'll put them in a list and every now and again, we'll answer them. <laughs> now, Charlie, <laughs> brilliant. I'm going to choose a question. I'm going to I'm gonna throw you under the bus. I'm just going to I'm gonna pick it. one from random just to make sure I can pick one that you don't actually haven't prepared for. That's good. I'll just go to the one at the top of the list. All right, this is from Liam Donnelly and he asks that, well, he outlines that we – have mentioned business model improvement on the podcast before. What does that actually look like practically? It's one of these things that, and what is the curse of knowledge when we just say like something and just assume everybody knows what we're talking about? Especially myself. I do that all the time, all the time. You're a bit better at articulating points. Would you like to help everybody? What is a business model, Charlie? Have you ever had that moment when you talk to someone who's like deep in IT or coding? And you would ask them a question. It's like, hey, my, my, my computer, it's like playing up. It's doing this thing. And then they just start speaking another language about like RAMs and SSDs and DDRs and GPUs. I, I feel like you've spoken to my brother before. <laughs> He's a developer, deep in it, deep yeah. in it. The curse of assumed knowledge, right? You understand something and then you assume other people do. Now, you and I, Grant, have spent a lot of time on business models where I could understand we may have, and it sounds like we have here, actually applied some assumed knowledge that people understand what business improvement is. So this is on us. We've done a poor job of explaining it. So I'll take this one here. To bring it back to like first principles in a way I think about it is that your business model is really a reflection of how you do business. That's the simple definition I use. I think it could be really powerful to use an analogy here to go through it because once you can, I suppose, grasp this analogy, I think it makes it much easier to bring in the business world. So I'm going to use fitness, all right? Work with me on this. Let's say you're someone who wants to lose 10 kilos. So you've got a fitness goal. Now, hint, hint, if you're in business, maybe you've got a goal of making 10 grand a month or 100 grand a month or whatever it is. So the first step with actually defining business model improvement is you have to have a measurement to improve against. So if you don't know what your goal is in business or in fitness here, well, any improvements you attempt to make, well, how do you know if it's an improvement? It's like, well, there is no goal. Everything is making it better or worse. So really, really key (laughs) point. If you're going to go down the path of wanting to improve your business model, you've got to be crystal clear on what you're actually trying to achieve. 
Now, yeah. the business model in fitness would be the strategies, tactics that you bring to produce that result. So let's say you're on a fitness plan right now and you are losing one kilo a month, right? Your business model is producing a result of a one kilo a month weight loss along this goal of losing 10 kilos. If you were going to make an improvement on that, maybe with changing your sleep or getting a new personal trainer or uh, changing your nutrition, you know, maybe you get a new diet. If you were able to increase the speed you lose weight from one kilo a month to 1.5 or two kilos a month, that would be a business model improvement. Now, what's the process of actually doing business model improvement? It's making changes to how you do fitness so you can increase your results. That's the way I, I think about this analogy. So when you bring that over to business, you've got your business, maybe it's producing a, an amount of profit for you right now, you've got a goal, you want to increase that profit, the changes you would make to how you do business would be the business model improvements. I think you summarized that perfectly. <laughs> was like, I practiced that so many times, you have no idea. <laughs> that was actually awesome. Because to, to continue on to that point, right, once you get your fitness to, um, I don't know, losing two kilos a month, right, and then you're consistently losing two kilos a month, in, when you get into month two, three, four, five, six, whatever, you get to stop and reevaluate because then you get to go, well, is this actually the goal that I want? Or by the time you keep losing two kilos a month, you're at a weight that you want to sustain. Your question is, well, how do I sustain this? Which is very different again, right? You will change maybe your sleep, your nutrition, your fitness or your workout plan to make sure you can maintain that. Or you might say, well, I want a different goal, right? I want to build more muscles. Oh, great. <laughs> it's fine. You can iterate it. And the challenge that I, th I feel that a lot of people have on this is they think that a change of business model is this entire pivot of a business where it's not. Like it can be these fractional improvements that are just done regularly. Like you can change it ever so slightly every month, for example. Every six months, for example, you can do a bigger change. Like it doesn't need to be this stop, pivot 180 degrees and let's go. It's like, no, it's like these little tweaks, little improvements as your personal goals change from your business or as your business goals change. Like, it's, it's as simple as that. I, I really like the way you've defined that. And uh, to elaborate a little bit further is like, you know, w well, the way I'm looking at it here, it could be something really minor. Tiny. Like a business model improvement just might be changing a supplier or a manager or a pricing Right. This might literally just be logging into your shopping cart provider and updating some prices to do things. But it can be large as well, right? It can be some pretty big ones, but it should not be confused with changing business. Changing business model and changing business, uh, I think, are different things. But uh, I really like the way you've articulated that. I'll throw in a, a couple of ones that I kind of find interesting or where I see people make some uh, interesting choices. We'll put it that way. And I didn't do this ever, just as I say this, right? I'm, I'm perfect, <laughs> remember. Stories of other people, other people's stories. It's great. Yeah, well, mostly when I try to say right now, it's like every time I say, oh, what have I observed what, in others, I'm really saying this is what I did. <laughs> Toby dies. Yeah, I'm trying not to just, you know, shit on myself too much, but we're here now. <laughs> I'll let you, just shit on yourself. It's good. All right, so for, for me, not even going to put anyone else in this one. <laughs> <laughs> Where I struggled to improve my business model initially was just this more mentality. So when it came to improving business is like, all right, well, I want more profit. I want to have more time. Like, do you know what? I want my revenue to be bigger. Like I want to reduce my risk. Like all these things in one thing and also really vague. So it's just like this more mentality without clarity. And that's a mistake when I think it comes to approaching business model improvement because one can actually work against the other. So reducing your risk might actually, you know, cost you money, but improving that goes directly against improving profitability if that was the goal you were going after. So vagueness and then confliction can be huge. And then the second one I come up against or have really struggled with at times is like being aware that things change, right? Things change. And then I could get stuck in and stubborn in my way. So it's almost like we settle and... I don't know, it can be really hard to get a business to work in general. And like when you do get one to work, so maybe you finally got a business producing 10 grand a month, the idea of changing things that work, too much. It's way so, too much. We settle, right? 
So like, oh, well, this is how we do sales. I'm comfortable in this. You might actually have to change the way you do sales to get to that next level. And that can be very confronting for people to make change. All right. Hang on. It's time for me to shit on myself too. <laughs> Go for on, it. This, on the reverse side, like one of the biggest challenges that I had in business model design was, so one of our software as a service companies, the whole goal was to sell for $100 million, right? But like that doesn't define a business model. Like how do I improve on that? So, well, the goal is a $100 million exit. It's like, great, like that's going to happen in 10 years time. So what are we operating as now? <laughs> and it's like, it's just too far. It's like, it's like going from being overweight and saying, I'm going to join Mr. Olympia. It's like, well, no, there's so many iteration, iterations you've got to do between now and then <laughs> in order to even get there. And so like that was one of the biggest problems that I had because I'm like, cool, let's go and build a business model around selling for $100 million. And I'm like, well, actually, there's a lot of different changes I have to do throughout that entire journey. So I just went just way too far. It wasn't ambiguous. It was just way too far ahead. That's really interesting. How, how, like, I don't, I'm not against people having goals like that. I love that as an overall goal for a business. But what would you suggest instead? Is this the idea of like, okay, we know eventually we want to sell for 100 million. Do we have like milestone goals? Or yeah, seasonality. Or months or something? Exactly. So it's like if I'm flying to Europe, I might go and have to stop off in like two cities along the way. I might have to go to Singapore, then I might have to go to I don't know, London, and then I might have to go to Rome, for example. And it's just breaking it down into more achievable bite-sized chunks. Like for example, for us, we went and raised a couple of million dollars. Okay, well, that's like that's the goal. It's like, how? what do we need to do now in order to raise a couple of million dollars so that we can actually go and unlock the next team that's gonna get us closer to a $100 million valuation. And so it's just breaking it down. And it's just, a, and I think that, like for myself, like it became quite challenging because I was operating or thinking about an organization that was going for a $100 million exit when I wasn't. <laughs> and it's like, that's just dangerous because I'm making decisions of a $100 million organization when I'm just not. Like it's like, you just can't win in that. You'll just dry yourself up. And yeah, so milestones uh, along the way based on the seasonality of where your business is to get you to that bigger goal. All right, so for setting a realistic goal when it comes to business model improvement, what type of duration do you think people should consider? Well, it was interesting. This was actually going to be my second point was like I then over, I actually overcorrected myself and I forced into review periods every six to 12 months, which business is not linear like that. <laughs> like things change at the drop of a dime. Like there's nothing saying that you can't iterate your business model every month. There's nothing to say that you can't iterate your business model smaller or shorter. It's more based on what are you trying to achieve and what feedback loop are you looking at it, right? So, for example, if I'm trying to – your example of a hundred uh, sorry, $10,000 a month in profit and imagine today I say I'm going to change the way my team delivers this to make it more profitable, right? So imagine we're using a piece of software to deliver some of the service. So maybe my profitability increases by 20% and I think that that will get me to my – $10,000 a month goal. If in one or two months, I'm seeing that, hey, it didn't get it to me, get me to my $10,000 or my got me to my $8,000 or $9,000, I'm not going to sit there and wait and hope, well, I'm just going to review this in six months time because that's when my next review is. I'm going to see that and get that feedback and say, all right, what else can I change? That obviously got me closer. What's the other thing that I can tweak? Or it might not have got me there at all. I'm going to change that out. So, I would almost say that this should be something on a business owner's mind continually, which is like, what are the tweaks that I've done? And looking for that feedback to say, what feedback am I getting that that was a right decision or a wrong decision? Because we won't always make the right decision and then adjusting along the way. And I would argue maybe that might be monthly and you might do a hard review every six months, for example, and go, have I challenged myself enough? Have I tweaked enough? Have I actually done enough in order to improve my business model? So that's what I'm going to say. Interesting. I, yeah. So let's bring this back to fitness though. Let's say, because I, I think it's really easy to conceptualize the fitness example and then bring it over to business. It's mm -hmm. actually what helped me to be clear on why I'm suggesting it so much. Um, if, if our goal was to lose 10 kilos, well, in your view, it's like, well, okay, we're going to be doing things and probably weighing in weekly, I would imagine, yep. monthly in this example. Yep. So you would set up some appropriate feedback loops 
where you can see if you're making progress and weight is the measurement we're using here. So in your example, it might be profit. We'll use profit. I think that makes it easy to understand. So bringing it to business, you might be looking to increase your profitability where every month you're now making a hundred grand. Okay. So hundred grand of profit. You've got these intervals where you're going to be weighing in. So maybe on a weekly basis, you can see how much cash is coming in. Might be a really good one. And then on a monthly basis, you've got your financial reports. So this, yep. these are your measurement points. And then based on that, you can then iterate or see how things are performing. So you could go, I've come up with these ideas to improve my business model. So again, we'll use some examples. Well, I want to improve my profitability. We're going to look at cutting some costs. So yep. cost cutting might be a business model improvement. Um, relocating uh, an office from being in Australia to maybe in the Philippines. So you're going to use offshore labor instead of onshore labor might be another cost-cutting endeavor you could go about. So cost-cutting might be one of the ways you look at improving your uh, business model. So how you do business in this case here, and that would be the check-in points along the way. So that's one. I, I could actually think of a, a few more here though. Should, should we lay down a few more for Let's pricing? Shoot it. Let's just, okay. just go backwards forward. All right, so the next one, I'm going to go after, I really love this one. If I was trying to improve the profitability in a business, one of the things that I have a huge bias towards is actually like um, moat and USP. Yep. So I would say that one of the things that uh, stops profitability in a business is they don't have a competitive advantage or a moat, and then they're unable to maintain higher prices. Like you look at Apple with the iPhone. They keep making <laughs> it keep more expensive. <laughs> I swear someone's sitting there just saying, like, can we just get this to $5,000 for a phone and see if people will pay for this? Like, I I'm think they've got to do it. In the, they're getting pretty close. <laughs> they're getting pretty close. <laughs> yeah. Totally. So I look at that and say, like, if I was trying to improve profitability on a company, like, let's not just look at this through, like, cutting costs. Is like, another way to potentially improve that would be to have a defendable position so you can charge more. Totally. And defend your pricing so you don't have to become like a commodity, which has happened a lot in like the SEO industry, which we've discussed at length. Yeah. And I love this one because this is also something that you can iterate in, right? We, we've, I think we've spoken about this on the podcast before, which is you might have a service like, hey, Charlie, did you know that we edit and produce in a media company for podcasts? Like, <laughs> didn't know. I had no know. idea. And Should we do this? That? There you go. So one of the moats for example for us back in the day it was like no one else was doing video and we like exclusively did video awesome there's a moat it uh, is I, a wait, I would argue we were early i know that's not early. a moat but it definitely was it's, an advantage it was a competitive advantage but that's exactly my point that i'm making is at the time it was a moat it was drying up very quickly because the first mover advantage gets lost very quickly which means then it's like what's the next moat like, how are you going to continue to iterate this in order for it to be a moat still. And so like we've spoken a lot about, well, okay, there are these new platforms that people can amplify their podcast on, such as TikTok. That is also really brand new to the market. It is for like potential first mover advantage, noting that the moat is never gonna be there forever, which I would argue that almost all moats aren't there forever. Maybe that's the thing that we jump into. Maybe we niche down and we focus in on, I don't know, car auto mechanics. And we just do that because our moat has dried up and we're not unique anymore. Now we're a commodity. Let's go and make ourselves unique again. Let's go and look for that next thing. And the best thing about it is we can test car mechanics doing podcasts, which I don't think would do very well, whilst retaining the rest of the business just to dip our toe in the water to see if it's going to work, right? Because every week you get your cash feedback. Every month you get your financial reporting feedback. And if in two months, three months, oh, it turns out the car mechanics don't want this thing, the three car mechanics I talked to just said yes because they're friends. I go, okay, let's tweak it again, <laughs> right? Maybe car mechanics is not the thing. Maybe I should be doing it for fitness people. All right, let's see what the fitness industry says, right? And you're always going out and bringing that feedback in to see is this the right decision? Because at the time, what does Keith Cunningham say? All my problems started off as a good idea. <laughs> like it was awesome. Like if you look at this on iterative tweaks and improvements, you can always play it back. You can always wheel it back and just change something different. And so, like, I know that was something that we do regularly as we go, do we still have a moat? Do we have something unique? Is there still that audience that wants what we've got? And if not, what are we going to do to change it? I can feel people right now going, oh, that's great. You guys have got ideas to do this, but how do I find what are the things that could improve my business model? 
All right, so I think it's a really interesting idea to go, okay, I know what a business model improvement is, the idea that I'm going to change how I do business. I can see there's all these ideas and strategies and tactics I could change. I could start CrossFit. I could start running. I could lift weights. I could go keto. I could do carnivore. I could be a fruitarian like Steve Jobs was. <laughs> <laughs> right, and then I understand the idea of feedback loops. So now that I'm going to select some of these changes, like and we've mentioned a few here, and I'm going to reiterate continually and go against that. I think conceptually, like most people who listen to this would uh, do it. The gap would be, how do I find out what the appropriate ones are? And I, I'm going to lay down some suggestions here because I feel like this would be a really good one. I found it really useful if you can uh, and find a mentor who's done your type of business before, right? Because they're going to have a lot of shortcuts on what a good business model would look like in this area that you just may or may not be aware of. Totally. I'm going to say two find and associate with people that have the same niche or business as you. So if they have an agency, see what they're doing in their agency versus what you're doing in your agency and see if there's business model improvements. It might be as simple as an upsell, right? And then three is I think you have to look to other business models. Like some of my best ideas have actually come from ripping off things that are standard in another industry. And um, Jay Abraham had a great book on this called Getting the Most Out of All You've Got which I think is a fantastic way. So if you're someone that can now conceptualize the idea of like what does business model improvement actually look like, like what's the process, so it's going to be uh, something we can look at there, this is where you can get some of the ideas and hopefully draw from some of this conversation as well to take that further. I love that. One of the caveats, uh, and we've spoken to a couple of people around this, is when they go to, I don't know, their comrades, their friends, their network and be like, hey, what do you think about this idea? Everyone's like, love it. Best thing I've ever heard ever because they're surrounded by people that want to support them and nurture them, et cetera. I think it's really important that I probably would not try and validate a business shift with friends who don't have a business in that same industry or in that same area, et cetera. And the reason I share that, Charlie, is we've spoken to some of those people and my biggest recommendation to them is go find people in the industry already and see what's going on. Find a mentor who's done the thing in order to say if it's a good good idea or a bad idea. Interestingly enough, in SEO, one of the things that I did was I actually went and spoke to people in different countries to see what they were doing and how they were changing compared to us in Australia, who was my who was my direct target market. Because I'm like, what products are you guys offering? Like, what's coming out from the US? What what are the changes that you've got versus what we have? Where maybe there's something unique I can bring to this market. Well, that would be the equivalent of like you change things in your fitness routine and then you just go around asking people, how do I look? It's <laughs> yeah, like, just no, no, you use the scales, right? You've got to have the, the appropriate measuring in place, right? You've okay. got to absolutely have the appropriate measuring. Should we do the next yeah. question? I think we did quite well. I think that was a good one. All right. Hey, maybe we don't, get to, we don't get to decide that. Oh, the yeah, audience yeah, yeah, gets yeah. to decide that. <laughs> you like I'm my biggest audience. It's all that matters. All right, Charlie, now <laughs> I feel like this is a question from me to you or you to me or something that a lot of people have actually faced. Is like, where do I actually run my business from? Do I buy a place? Do I rent a place? Do I set up an office at home? Like, well, where do I, what do I do here? How do I sort of approach it from an ROI perspective or an otherwise perspective? Because we've obviously sit at home in our home offices and record these things. Like, I'm curious. When people ask you, what are you thinking about doing? What do you respond with? I think type of business dictates this a lot to start with. So if you're a car mechanic, you need a workshop. So that would be very different than someone who has an agency, for example, who, where working virtually is very possible and even Record. encouraged these days. So I think that's a huge thing. So if your business requires an in-person type scenario versus virtual, your decision-making process becomes very, very interesting. Um, the first thing I'll say is never uh, in the world has there been a more encouraging time to do work from home. I think that what has incurred in the last few years has really highlighted to people what's uh, possible through technology. And going back to our first question, if you're looking at a way to potentially be more profitable, going from a company that has a lot of in-person locations to one that works remotely would be a significant cost-cutting measure and also open up the talent you could get because you're not limited to your geography anymore. 
Um, so I think that's an interesting idea and suggestion for people to look at in general. But um, taking this deeper, let's um, look at this through a different lens or the way I really think about it here. I think you've got to look at best return on capital. I think that's probably the yeah. most important thing to consider here. So if putting money into having an office and uh, buying one is going to be the best return on capital for you, that's a very likely good decision. I say likely because I can't give financial advice. But if it's not, right, well, then, then you've got to think about this a little bit differently. In what sense? Like of enjoyment? Like you screw the money as long as I will enjoy it because it's close to my house and it's away from, I don't know, Jack having some fun in the background. Like how do you think about it differently? All right. So I'll start with the – let's use an agency as the example and you're debating do I have everyone work from home versus do I have everyone in an office? If the cost of the office – was to improve productivity or quality of work that outweighed the cost of the office, I'd say do it. So if it costs you an extra 10 grand a month to have a nice office in the CBD somewhere, but when you get your team together, you're producing projects that the quality is just outstanding, you couldn't replicate that from home, I think that's a justifiable expense to do so and would even look at that and say, great idea because your work quality manship has uh, done so much better. So that would be the, and then conversely is if you go, well, hang on, I can get better talent uh, because I've now got access to the USA. So I can get different people that have skills to en enhance quality virtually. Well, then I would say, well, then it makes more sense for you to work from home. Absolutely uh, appropriate, appropriate to do it in that way because you can approve, approve the quality of work. That capital also frees up within that business in the work from home scenario where they can do other things with it. So maybe they can access more marketing spend or hire, uh, spend more money on the people rather than the premise. Or maybe they can take that money and invest it in uh, paying down their mortgage quicker if that's what they've got. So there's appropriation of capital that I think comes into this conversation as well. Now, Isn't, going into the other one here quickly, and I know I'm ranting on, but I want to cover this no, in a different point because I missed something very critical in that one that comes into this one. Let's say you're that mechanic and you're debating, do I rent a workshop versus buy a workshop, right? Well, this is where, again, I come down to like, it could be a very good investment to buy that workshop and have that land and premise appreciate over time. And then you potentially sell that premise into your retirement plan or lease it out to the next generation of mechanics, right? On the other side of things, if you were to lease that, maybe that frees up capital in your business where you would actually be able to have more stock or get more staff and on a monthly basis that business would actually be more profitable. So rather than having your capital tied up in a premise and then you can't afford to market or you can't afford to hire the apprentices or get the equipment that would make you more efficient, then that would suggest that it's a different way to do it. Now that kind of thinking actually does apply to the agency as well. They could buy an office versus rent one, but I wanted to save it for that example. Um, I will keep going here because I do like the sound of my own voice. <laughs> so what's really interesting is like Bunnings rent. Like yeah. literally Bunnings don't buy their locations because they have appropriated that the capital in that business is better used buying stock. They need to make sure they have the cash to fill these factories, not own these factories. If all their money was tied up in owning the land and the factories that they operate the business, business within – they wouldn't have as much stock or as many locations. So it's, it's kind of like this. You get, that example for me, when I heard it, completely shifted my view on leasing versus buying an office because I had been biased on that idea as well. So anyway, I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, there's so many points for me to riff off now. My mind's like go all this list. It was really interesting. So I know a gentleman uh, and you know what? I'm going to go with the second point first. It's funny how you spoke about like the concept of Bunnings not buying property and just leasing it because they want to purchase more stock because McDonald's is completely different, right? Through the States, McDonald's wanted the property and then we're basically putting McDonald's on them. Now, the interesting thing is business model, <laughs> right? We were just talking is about that, business Is model. that just going to be the common theme through all it, of this? But I think this is the, the – I'm just going to keep bringing it up every single time we – sort of touch on this topic because this is how embedded business models are in absolutely everything. It's like, well, that is a business model decision. Like you are deciding 
that the better thing is the selling the product or the better thing is buying the property. Like this has to fall back into your business model to validate. That is such a good example, by the way, because you got to remember that McDonald's is literally just a, it's a hamburger restaurant, right? But look what their business model, like better business model one here. (laughs) If you are able to think about and re-engineer a business model to be that, look at what has happened. So So, very, very fascinating. I know, so here you go. I know a guy and I won't, won't mention who, but (laughs) the story will probably allude to it anyway. Screw it. So this guy owned a motorcycle store in Melbourne CBD and he's a friend of mine, great guy. It was, it would have been about 20 odd years ago. He had the opportunity to buy the building for a couple hundred thousand dollars. And it's, it's kind of in the CBD, but it's kind of just a little bit sort of towards the north of it. Um, And he said, no, it's just too expensive. Right. And so he rented this thing for 20 years. He only moved a couple of years ago. Um, so he rented this thing for about 20 years and it just came up for sale for several million dollars. And he was just like, why? Like keep kicking himself. He's like, here I am selling motorcycles and all I needed to do was buy the property, operate out of it, basically pay the mortgage down and I would be in a fundamentally different financial position here. And it goes back to that concept of what are you trying to play? Like in order for him to make that, I'm going to buy this property decision, he would have needed to know a lot more about real estate that he did not know at that time and he still doesn't know than the business model of running the business, which is selling motorcycles, buying them cheap, selling them, doing all those kind of things, right? So I would also add to the top of what you're saying. It's like for the person who's looking to buy the premise, do they know enough about the area, about the asset they're looking to buy in order to mitigate the risk of it not going up, mitigate the risk of what happens if their business goes through a dry month and they need to make a mortgage payment. Like what are the other risks that are associated to it to justify whether or not that is the right thing to do, which is buy the premise in order to operate the business from. And so there's layers to that as well, right? Because so many. if you were going to rent the same joint for 20 years, the rent's going to go up over those 20 years. Which so it did. In the, yeah, so in the long run, you may have actually been better off buying because at rent at year ten, it's cheaper to pay the mortgage than it is the rent. But that would insinuate that maybe you want to be there for twenty years. So if you're Completely. you're going to outgrow your workshop, are you going? I'm only going to be here for five, knowing that I need a bigger one at another point. That would come into this decision making as well. So I think that's or, a really interesting layer, and you hit it even deeply, like. Melbourne CBD and what has occurred in Australia with real estate isn't the experience all of Australia has had. Like if you had bought that property in Perth in the peak of the mining boom, you would have lost a lot of money. And But this is where it comes to, right, which is making an educated decision as opposed to making a decision that's very difficult to wheel back from. Um, and so, yeah, so in that scenario, uh, I actually think that he was wanting to sell the business prior and so looking at it he's like well who wants to buy a business and a building and like there's arguments to say well if you sold the business you could have rented it and done all these things sure but again when you're a business owner looking at this huge mortgage that you'd have to start paying and you're backing yourself because the only way i'm going to pay that is through my business that's the decision the sleep at night factor and we've spoken about this a lot right would you sleep at night knowing that if you didn't make that money you had zero places to go (laughs) Like you just can't go and negotiate with Commonwealth Bank and be like, hey, I'm a nice guy. Can I just like not pay you this month? You can't. And so the sleep and night factor for him was more important than not. And he also thought he was going to outgrow it too as well. He's like, it's too small. I need something bigger. And then he was there for 20 years. I actually think I've got a bias towards leasing a premise and buying property outside my business. I I really do. There would not be many circumstances that would change my mind on that. And I'll just throw in something that I would consider if I was making this decision. My view on business is it's highly volatile. Things change. And the idea of being stuck with a certain type of asset in different environments challenges me quite a bit. So in the example of your friend, let's say he's got motorbikes and then suddenly for whatever reason that industry changes dramatically. His biggest competitor opens up on the same street and all of a sudden he's got no ability to compete and he's stuck with this building he owns. Because that type of asset could take a long time to sell, I mean, how many people are looking for that specific type of premises? Tiny, yeah. What type of ability does he have to pivot if that should come up? 
So I think yeah. that a consideration to put in is like industry risk. And uh, if I owned a, like, well, we have a media agency. Grant, I'm pretty sure media has changed since we've been on this call. <laughs> it has. <laughs> yeah, so yes. imagine if I was like owning real estate there like the or, or putting up a lot of capital stuck in here where I actually might need to make sure I've got enough free capital to pivot this business model. So I think there's some considerations around risk that would be appropriate to consider. Um, I will. And like, again, I'm not against people owning their premises. It's just that would be purely an opinion here of me about the bias towards leasing because I value flexibility. Can I, can I throw in a story? Go for it. So um, one of my businesses, uh, it, we had an office in Melbourne CBD and it was rented from one of the sort of the, the lease and office companies. We then increased our team size dramatically. So in this office, we actually had two offices next to each other and it had like a, a side sort of meeting room, 22 seats. And I can give you the numbers because they are burnt into my head from this experience. At the time, it was pre-COVID. So we had 22 seats, we had full office, COVID hit, everyone working at home, right? And we sort of restructured the organization around the same time as well. Spoke to this company and we said, hey, like we need to, we need to downsize. Like we don't see everybody coming back to the office and we've already restructured, we've already done all these things, we need less office. And their response was like, sure, you just get to keep the $280,000 contract value that you have. Because we signed a two-year lease on something that was about twelve grand a month for the for the office, so here I am trying to re like renegotiate two hundred eighty thousand dollar contract to try and shrink it down because our business had changed. We had this big pandemic that came through, swept us off our feet. We restructured. Everyone's working from home as well. I'm like, I'm never going to need this. And so, literally, we signed like a five six year lease for like a four seat. <laughs> which now no one goes to. But it's like those are the things that like at the time, did I think that was going to happen? No. Like it was like, oh, cool. It's 12, 13 grand a month. No worries at all. Like, yeah, but fine. imagine if you owned that. Imagine if it, the I company know. had said we bought – we like don't get me wrong, you're still like very challenging circumstance with leasing and needing to downsizing. But I would much rather that challenge than trying to sell office space in a pandemic. <sighs> it's funny because <sighs> to that point, also during the pandemic – I was running a service office myself <laughs> at the same time. That just went through a massive pivot. And it was like, great, we're just going to offer like virtual services, which is like virtual addresses, virtual offices, a virtual receptionist, all those kind of things. Because, yeah, you've got these offices that aren't being used by anybody. So can anyway, I, wait, can dude, I bring this these is... back to business model again? <laughs> if yes, you buy a premise, you're limiting your business model because you won't have the ability to go virtual if that was something for you. And I, a type exactly. of business matters here. But even then, I'm sure there's someone out there that was a mechanic and has pivoted to teaching mechanic classes online. I'm sure it's happened. There'll be someone totally. out there doing it on YouTube right now. Totally. Or a mechanic that, yeah, uh, now they're renting out, I don't know, their lifts, their car lifts to four different mechanics within the one spot so that everybody can have their little business kind of thing now. But, yes, business model is critical, Charlie. Do you want me to can go I throw in one more? I'm going to throw in one oh, more. There you go. All right, go, okay, go. Okay. If you're not buying a premise to do your business from, that would also free up capital to potentially buy more house. So if you're someone who can work from home, you may ten put the lens on or look at that you may be able to inject that capital into your home. So there's a different way to look at it in that as well. But I'll, I'll leave that point there. Let's go to another we just, question. We could just kind of totally continue on this one. All right. So this, this one it might be the last question, by the way. Uh, so this one's been an interesting one. So you and I mentor people and um, one of the biggest pre prefaces that you and I always say is what's really important is prioritization and sequencing. And although it sounds very logical on the surface, one of the things that I get back is like, what do you mean? Why? Why is this important? Why can't I have two or three or four things happening at the same time? Um, because I'm a, I'm a wonder person. I'm a business owner. I can just achieve it all. And it's like, well, it's just a matter of priority and it's a matter of sequencing. And so it was one point that I just keep getting asked and I'm like, I, I got to ask this on the pod because I think we got to make sure that we dive deeper into it so other people sort of can understand the concept at a lower level. So my question to you, Charlie, is like, what do you mean by prioritization and sequencing? Yeah, so prioritization is picking the most important thing to work on. 
and then sequencing would be the order of which you work on things next after that. So you might have five things you need to do. You need to pick which of the five is the most important and then the second most, the third most, the fourth most and so on. But then there's this layer to it of like, well, how many can you do at once? So for some people, what I have seen, and again, never done, is if there's five priorities, I'll just go and do all five priorities at once. I will not prioritize or sequence them. And uh, my finding in myself and others, this isn't just a shit on Charlie, this is what I see, is many business owners will take on too much at once and then do many things poorly and then it ends up taking much longer and being done, as I said, poorly. Now, the... It's very, very challenging. And I'll, I'll say the symptom I see is when a business owner plans, they seem to plan to their capacity. So if they've got 10 hours spare, they say, well, I'm going to fill up all 10 hours, completely forgetting the idea that when does business ever go perfect? It's not like an emergency could come up or a change that would need some of those 10 hours or you've got to take a call or a kid is sick or your wife needs you or you're sick or whatever it is. So what ends up happening is maybe they could have done those several priorities But instead, they end up doing many of them poorly condensed into a smaller time block because life and business happens. So sequencing and prioritization is the strategy to actually getting things done at a higher standard. Yeah, and the the way I always articulate it is that when, when it comes to sequencing, there is no two things that happen first. There's no two things that happen second. It's a sequence. Like it's like it is a numbered list. It goes one, two, three, four. Like you can't have two ones. You can't have four fours. Like it's, no, it's a sequence of one. And then a lot of people go, well, why? Why can't I have two number ones? I'm like, I get the point that you're making, right? I understand it, but it just can't work that way. You, there's always one thing that is needs to happen before everything else, and then there's another thing that needs to happen after it. Or otherwise, what you're going to do is exactly what you mentioned. You're going to do everything half assed and so I actually had a conversation with someone uh, literally it was two days ago where they're trying to do a rebrand, but they're also trying to do like a video shoot. And they listen to this podcast and they know exactly who they are. Hey, um, And they, they wanted to do both of them at the same time. They're like, I well, want to plan for this awesome photo shoot and I want to do this rebrand at the same time. I said, that's awesome. Now imagine you did the photo shoot planning first and you completed that to 100% of your capability and then – You did the rebrand next to 100% of your capability and you just sequence it as opposed to doing the photo shoot at 80% and the rebrand at 80% and you have 80% of the outcome. I'm like, which one's actually going to create a better result for the business? And obviously it's doing 100%, 100% (laughs) as opposed to 80s. And so for them it was like, oh, I'm not actually giving up a lot in order to do that sequentially do this thing first and then that thing second because the like you're still going to have the same outcome for them. Like there was no impact on the other side of if some, one thing was done a week later or a couple of days later. And so that was a great articulation around like this is the sequence and the priority. And the reason the photo shoot was so more important than the rebrand was because the talent was already booked in. You, you can't move the talent. I'm like, so well, That would make it the priority, right? If you've got exactly. a hard date on something, you have to prioritize accordingly. Yeah. Where, uh, where does this come from? Do you feel like this is just like a high achiever syndrome? The idea we of doing things yeah. one at a time makes us think it's more slowly happening, even though it's not, but it's like some sort of like mental thing. But it's also, I think it, like from my experience and through working with the CEOs of sort of some of the companies that I work with, I think that the challenge that they've got is how do you choose which child is your favorite? How do you choose which one is more important to work on right now? Like I can see this one's more important because it's going to impact revenue and this point's more important because it's going to help scalability. It's like neither of them are more important. And so they can't actually decide. So it's like this paralysis analysis where it's like, well, no, both of them have to happen. And the one time it's like, well, no, in actual fact, which one is more important? Like what, if you don't get this one done for a couple of days, what's the impact versus the other one? What are you actually foregoing? And the, I think the problem is that we don't actually think critically enough of the things that we're working on. We're just thinking of it like a to-do list and we're trying to work through these things because we we love putting out fighters. We love jumping on things, squashing them and going, done. And looking at a list at the end of the day saying, yay, win, even though the, 
the one or two things at the top of the list had never done. <laughs> They're always the ones that like keep popping up in the calendar and keep appearing. I'm like, it's like everything else is like what not to do. And that one is it. Like that, that is it. But I think a lot of people just don't want to choose that because usually it is the thing they're uncomfortable about. Maybe it is because they're uncomfortable about doing sales. So they just put it on the back burner and they just don't want to do it. Even though that is probably the number one thing they probably should do is do the sales or they're not comfortable doing operations. And so they keep pushing it back. So you kind of looped points here. So I want to break this one down. Uh, the first one I think most people will agree with is like doing one thing at a time is more efficient than doing two things at once. Like if you've got a plate full of Rubik's cubes, it doesn't make sense trying to solve two Rubik's cubes at once. You do one and then you move on to the next one. I think everyone can conceptualize doing one thing at a time is more efficient and gets a better result. The prioritization thing though is where this gets a bit more interesting because deciding which Rubik's cube to focus on when they all seemingly are important and could be important challenges people because they feel like that is there. How would you encourage someone prioritizes? Yeah. So I always come back to critical chain management. It's like I got, I got a hose, right? And my goal is to just get the water flowing through that hole, that hose, right? So it could be $10,000 uh, a month is the profit that I'm going for. And that's what I'm trying to achieve. And this hose has got 10 kinks in it, Charlie. All I need to do is unkink all those 10 kinks and I make my $10,000 a month. What a lot of people do is they start looking for kinks and they might remove kink number four. The flow doesn't improve. They remove kink number eight. Flow doesn't improve. What they need to do is they need to remove kink number one, number two, number three, in order for that water to start flowing through the hose to get to the outcome they're going for. And so the, the thought process is more, what is the one major blocker that is really impacting that flow in order for me to get towards my 10,000. And once I well, release it's not even that, the It's not even the major, it's the next. It's like correct. what's the next thing in front of me stopping the flow? And by the yeah. way, great book. I know where you're getting this from. Uh, the Goal by <laughs> the Eli goal. Goldratt. What a, great what a book. I will also mention the greatest audio book ever. So if you are looking for a book, highly recommend The Goal by Eli Goldratt and the audio book. Because they, they paid to have multiple voice actors and sound effects. I read it. So Dude, now i got to go and listen to the audio book. Sensational. Um, like it's actually really well done. But anyway, back to the point, the theory of constraints being to think of the business like a garden hose. So it's like exactly. not so much why, what is the biggest problem but what is the next problem that would unkink that hose I think is a really powerful framework. And so that's the way I think about prioritization and sequencing, John. So when you think of a, a – garden hose right and the idea of that is like what's interesting is that if you unkink it in the right order the flow increases along the way where if you unkink it from the other end and work back the flow doesn't necessarily improve at the same rate so it's fascinating in that regard Complete. because you might not actually need to solve kink number six seven eight and nine or ten it might actually just be solved because you solve kinks number one two and three and four because it's naturally it will just unkink itself all right, but so Monday on, rolls so. around for someone next. Maybe they should draw out their priorities and think of it as a garden hose and evaluate it through the lens of next. I like that. I really like that. Yeah. Sometimes taking analogies from books works. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> Shall we wrap this one up? I reckon we'll wrap it up. Awesome. To everyone listening, thank you very much for catching us on this episode. I just want to say as well, if you do want to jump on the newsletter, head over to businessandinvesting.com forward slash newsletter, put in your details and we'll let you know every single time we release one of these episodes. I just want to say thank you again and we look forward to catching you on the next episode of Business and Investing.